Yeah, I'm started. Okay. So what I wanted to talk about was, um, and I'm a bit wary. Oh, oh, you can only come in if you tell me your name. What's your name, sir? Uh, Merrick. Merrick. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just a bit wary because often I give a presentation and I realize I talk about the same old stuff. Okay, I'll stop with the name now thing because uh, people keep coming in. They'll keep interrupting me. Um, so... Because it, it all really boils down to kind of ancient principles and uh, and you know the the meaning of life and wisdom and all that sort of thing. But if you get to that too soon, it all sounds a bit like motherhood and apple pie. So there's really two slides in my presentation. Um, they're both Venn diagrams um, for no reason whatsoever because they're not actually Venn diagrams. We'll get to that. But essentially, it's what we're hearing from the market in terms of what's going on and all the cool stuff, and then what's actually going on from the organizations we speak to and, uh, and how, how software is actually being, being written and created and so on. And largely, I, I think, because so I should introduce myself. So, so my name is John Collins. I'm an industry analyst. I spent 15 years of my career uh, in a real job. Uh, I started as a programmer. I've got a very, very, very small reference to, to myself and uh, my... Uh, old student uh, house sharing mate, uh, Steve Pate, in the French Linux manual, uh, written by uh, René Cunyank, who uh, later died, which is really sad. Um, but uh, so 1989, I first uh, got, got involved in, in the Linux thing, but not in the way that real people, you know, that actually get involved in it. Oh my God, you know, that kind of, because uh, it's, it's, it's been such a movement and it's been so powerful. But I, I was running Sun uh, Microsystems environments and so on. So I just wanted something to play with. And so, uh, so I, I got to know the Minix user group and, and through that, the, the Linux user group. So that's kind of my, I can kind of get away with being here a little bit because of that tiny little, uh, but it was about what does a daemon mean, by the way. And I can't even remember, but it's something, something monitor. Uh, but the, um, uh, then I became 99 industry analyst, uh, and the great thing about being an industry analyst is you just think about stuff all the time. There's two great things actually. The first is you just think about stuff all the time, uh, rather than in a real job you've got no time to think. You're running from meeting to meeting to meeting. You're finding out that what you thought was right next week is wrong. You're firefighting all the time. You've got and I did have, you know, Sun Microsystems would come and see me and say, what do you want to buy? And I'm like, I don't know, it's all too complicated. And literally it was all coping strategies. But then when I became an industry analyst, actually I just got to think about the stuff that I'd been trying to think about for 15 years, which was amazing. Oh, and I, I missed out the bit where I was a soft development consultant. I did some ITIL stuff and I was working at uh, UK, for the UK government. Um, so I got all my clearances and I, so I'm pretty much Mr. DevSecOps if you want to, if you want buzzword bingo, uh, I'm, I'm pretty much there. But um, since then, I, I think working for smaller analyst firms, you had to cover everything. Uh, but really the only things that I care about are those, those three things, because that's my career, if you like. So development operations and throwing a, throwing a modicum of security. So I can't, don't ask me anything about analytics because it just goes horribly wrong very quickly. But uh, that, that's, that's pretty much me in background. And um, I suppose I should say what, what we're going to talk about. So as I said, there's, there's, two, there's two themes really. It's like, what is the next big thing? We can all talk about that. Um, uh, and, uh, but then what I wanted to do was bring that down a level and say, so what's actually going on behind the scenes and, and what, does, what does that really mean? And uh, jumping ahead to bullet point four is slide eight, uh, uh, the sl supply chain hook. Um, and um, I think this is the last presentation I'll ever do, by the way, as an aside, without a ukulele, because I really feel I'm just lacking something up on stage, but you know, we'll come back to that. And, and then... Uh, how do we actually get there? Because I have worked in this job for 33 years and we've been talking about this crap for as long as I have been doing it. And we're still saying, we're gonna solve. I, I literally had a vendor, um, there's that word, uh, call me up and say, we've worked out how to get on top of the software supply process. And I was like, that's so great, I'm so pleased. And they said, we understand you're a bit of a skeptic. And I'm like, I'm really not. I really don't want to be. I want to really believe that you've, this time you've solved it. You've, you've really worked it out. Um, but I don't think that necessarily just kind of working out a way of looking at processes is the way to do it, which we'll come to. Um, but a little bit about GigaOM. We write reports uh, about technology. Essentially, um, 
and um, we've got a lovely graphicist called Scott who does, who does pictures like this, and it all looks great, and it all looks very professional, and, and so on and so forth. And if you want to understand kind of what's behind the scenes of GigArm's kind of working model, it, essentially we write an RFP just like an end user organization would, and then we genericize, have a kind of generic, what are the questions you should be asking the vendors, and then we just press play and see what happens. And that, that's kind of it. So, so we're kind of reflecting what I used to do when I was buying stuff. We're just buying stuff. And our kind of secret source as an analyst firm is the people that we tend to use are people like me that actually had a job beforehand outside of being an analyst. So, uh, and uh, as, as a quick anecdote, which is unrelated, but it's got the punchline in it. Uh, when I was working as a software consultant, I was working for an insurance company and we were building great things and it was all gonna be fantastic. And I was in there doing UML and use case driven design and all that sort of thing. And then, um, so we worked out exactly what we we're gonna build. And then we went to see the ops people and said, so uh, we're, gonna, we're building some new software. We want you to run it. And they were like, when? And we said, three weeks time. And they went, you are joking. You, you're absolutely joking. You're, you're expecting suddenly me to, and this is back in the 90s, you're, you're expecting me to be able to spin up an entire architecture so you can run your software in three weeks. I mean, procurement, just filling in the forms takes four weeks, you know, um, which makes another story in my head, but I'm not going to tell you that, but it's uh, about procurement. Uh, but, um, uh, well, essentially, that was filling in a form in sex duplicate and then throwing away three of the copies. Yeah, that, that back then. But... He said, and he used this expression, the people out there have no idea what it's like in here. And that expression's really stuck with me, right through being a consultant, right through being an analyst. You just have to have had your feet burned. You have to have been shouted at. You have to have broken things and think on a Friday evening and thought, oh crap, or on a Monday morning, which is even worse. You have to have let that backup job go. And then it says it's going to take 44 hours to complete and everyone's just coming into work. Or you have to have had the pallets of new servers pile up in the car park because you don't know how to plug them in because the health and safety guy hasn't turned up. All of those things are what feed our research. So we do all this really nice, neat stuff. And, um, but this is a bit more how my brain works. So I sat down in a cafe once and thought, what's actually going on in tech? And this came out. Um, kind of by accident, but it, it, it kind of, uh, and it's starting to be a little bit five years old now, uh, but it was just this kind of, oh, well, it's like this and building that, and that's kind of how my head works. And I'll send you a copy if you like, just ask me afterwards. But it, it's essentially what I'm trying to do is, is marry those two things. I'm, I'm trying to marry the very kind of, you know, formalized models and so on and so on with, Whoa, it's all very exciting uh, and, and maybe a little too philosophical from, from time to time. By the way, the point of the picture is there's all the new and then we're tr still trying to make it work with the old. And it's really interesting now when we're starting to talk about yeah, cloud repatriation, all that sort of thing, uh, and the multi-cloud, multi-platform, on-prem uh, hybrid architecture, that it's still very relevant, but that side's starting to push back in again. Um, so... On to trends, which is the whole point of the presentation, so I really need to get to it. Um, and how are we doing for time? Uh, you will tell me when I'm kind of five minutes before, won't you? The people at the back, you'll start waving madly, um, I hope. Uh, so, um, next big thing. Really, we're seeing it in three areas. So, productivity processes and platforms, uh, which I chose that because it all starts with P, I'm not going to lie. Um, but the, these are the things that we're all talking about. So when, when we speak to the big vendors right now, you cannot go into the room without the, the AI bullet point. And it's, it, it's clearly, you know, this year it's gone from a, a kind of nice to have, from a nice to have to a need to have, certainly on your marketing slides. And we're, we're seeing a lot of, I mean, as analysts, a lot of people confuse analysts with journalists, so we just get all the PR all the time, don't we? Uh, so many press releases about, oh, we've built a new LLM, oh, we've just applied it to healthcare, oh, we've done this, oh, we've done that. It's all, it's all amazing and it's all fantastic. And it's actually quite good. Um, so th has anyone played with Copilot and you know, all, all of that stuff? Um, it, it's a, a, a colleague of mine actually tried, you know, sort of just to, whatever the, the, the commands would be for, you know, write me the singularity. And that didn't work, which was a bit disappointing, I have to be frank, um, that it couldn't just uh, 
build the entire um, Skynet just there, just there with a single command. But it, it's actually pretty good, and it's actually very good at, uh, we're seeing it in, in the security area, as, as you may have seen, uh, security tools are now starting to um, uh, build in AI. Every year, the, the way our reports are structured, by the way, you've got the kind of the things everyone needs to do, the table stakes, the mandatory requirements for an RFP, and then you've got the differentiating uh, features, uh, and then you've got the things that are coming, the roadmap stuff. And for three years, we've, AI has always it's been on the roadmap of every single software category we're looking at. Suddenly, it's not. Suddenly, it, it, it's become a key feature. So that, that's really interesting. And we're seeing that across uh, security, for example, you know, um, SIM tools, um, security incident and event management tools are now bringing in AI to, um, to, to uh, look through all the logs and, and find the interesting stuff. And also preempt by, by looking for weird behaviors. We're seeing it in UEBA, user and entity behavioral analysis. We're seeing it uh, in AI ops and uh, in ops in general, uh, in terms of um, uh, the first job. I mean, it's, it's always the boring stuff that happens first, but it's always useful boring stuff. So it's noise reduction in AI. I, I used to work, at the, when I was working for Alcatel doing the Sun stuff, that was uh, network management. So many, so many things that you could find out about your, your telecoms network. And so much of it was pointless. So much of it was just rubbish noise. Uh, so AI is super useful for those things. Is it going to break everything that we're doing? That's what the debate is all about right now. Um, uh, but I just had, I mean, jumping around a little bit, but when I spoke to a, a colleague who's just joined us, he, he's um, uh, uh, Daryl. He's worked for 37 years in, in uh, data management. And he said, look, it's just more automation. It's always about automation. Um, and you kind of go, and it, it's one of those things that you, there's more to it than that, but at the moment he said that, I couldn't think of any. Um, it, it, it's one of those ones. So, so the debate will continue. But it's, it's great, um, and it's, it, it can really help um, people get to develop things faster. I think it causes problems as well uh, in software. I think it immediately, uh, because the trouble with tech is it doesn't know when to stop. And uh, I have this ongoing debate with the hyperscalers, hyperscalers, yeah, AWS, GCP, et cetera, that they deliberately caused people to spend more money than they should do. Uh, and now we're talking about um, yeah, cloud cost management and, uh, uh, and all that, that kind of thing. They didn't. They just didn't stop people from doing it. And would you? If someone said, oh, we're just going to do more and more and more with the clouds uh, and then be out of control with it, you're like, Carry on, great. I'll do. <laughs> As uh, I remember, uh, my, my Oracle uh, sales uh, rep when I was when I was back in the job, uh, he, when we realised that our Oracle spend was out of control, and the way that Oracle licensing worked at the time was to have uh, any th any unit of licensing, whichever was the bigger one, was it users, was it processes, was it instances, whichever was the bigger one, that's the one they charge you for. And, uh, and so we, we got completely stung on processes because we had everything as a microprocess long before containerization. And we got completely stung. And all he did was just put on this big grin and said, I'm going to the Bahamas, I'm going to the Bahamas. But, you know, so you can't, you can't blame, blame vendors for just kind of going, thank you very much. But that's, that's really what, um, uh, um, I, I, I digress a little bit, but... Uh, Something that AI can do, pulling it back in again, is, is, is help get on top of those costs as well. Um, processes. I write, my last report was on value stream. Is anyone here familiar with value stream management? I'm going to mention it a bit in a minute. Um, so let me tell you about value stream management. It is, is anyone here familiar with business process management and the whole kind of drawing out business processes and then looking for where, the, where you can make them more efficient? Kind of. It's that, all right? So uh, when I was speaking to, um, I mean, that's a bit of a misnomer. I went to a CloudBees event. CloudBees brought one of their best customers along. It was a big bank. It was HSBC. And publicly and on stage, they said, we've got 5,000 different software development processes because we've got 5,000 applications. And each one has a completely individualized software development process. And I thought, that, I mean, it was kind of, thank you. But it's a bit like saying you are completely 100% zero competence in your organisation around standards or anything else. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tell, um, but but that's that's the reality. So value stream management is essentially the discipline of 
writing down all your processes, working out where the commonalities are, and then working out how to get value out of your processes. And uh, just while I finish the thread on value stream management, it's, it's about two things. One is becoming more efficient. It's looking for bottlenecks. So, you know, everyone's developing stuff with Glee and throwing it at testing, and there's only three people in the test team, and they're saying, well, I'll get around to it in three weeks' time. And then suddenly you get towards the actual deployment, and uh, uh, everyone goes, oh, crap, we've, we've got, like, you know, 2,300 feature points that still haven't been tested, not even individually, never mind against each other, and everything falls in a heap. So it, it addresses that sort of thing for efficiency and uh, within the process, but then it also addresses it uh, in terms of effectiveness. And if we go back to the original Phoenix Project kind of stuff, um, that was all about if I deploy a feature, am I going to see an increase in sales? If I deploy a feature, are customers going to like me more? If I deploy a feature, uh, uh, does my net promoter score go up. And it's so very much um, the Spotify model, they've, they've applied a lot of that too. And value stream management enables you to kind of stick some metrics onto, onto your stuff and then make better prioritizations and so on and so forth. It's great. Most people are um, Dora metrics, familiar with that? Dora, don't ask for it, DevOps. Uh, um, it bifurcated, didn't it? it went to go, I remember more about the politics than the um, than, the, than what the thing is. It's metrics about uh, software delivery. So, so it's you know, time to resolution. It's uh, you know, the number of feature points you can deliver at, in, within a certain period of time. There's a lot of noise o over that as well. Really interesting. And the tools that are helping deliver on that are kind of the cut down version of value stream management, which is the value stream analytics uh, stuff. Um, so it's just literally having a dashboard onto your software processes. All very good, all very useful. Uh, Vendors are talking a lot about it, so, so we're seeing that. And then finally, platforms, which is kind of, um, I mean, was anyone here, at, uh, the, did anyone go to KubeCon in Amsterdam? One, uh, I mean, what a, what a buzz, what, a, what, a, what an amazing event. Uh, it's just literally, it's kind of taking, in my top three big events where you're just gonna see everyone and everything's happening and so on and so forth, between AWS reInvent and, uh, and KubeCon, uh, they're now my top two. It, fantastic event. Everyone's talking about Kubernetes. I could stick some charts up. You know, that's what analysts normally do, and they, they, they say, you know, this is where it was, this is where it's going to be, etc. Um, three years ago, when we were asking about Kubernetes, everyone said, yeah, we're kind of piloting that. So if you asked, are you doing it? You'd probably get a kind of blanket yes, three, four years ago. But actually, you'd find it was the librarian had built something in his kind of, um, you know, and, and, and then when you... Then when you do the survey, if you actually just only ask the librarian, it looks like the whole of um, uh, Morgan Stanley Bank is doing it because there's this one little pocket. So, so we, but we were seeing a lot of pilot studies. Uh, literally 18 months later, everything flipped and it became the de facto way of thinking about software development. I'm not saying, and, and we, we can have a long debate about, um, by the way, I. As I said at the beginning, I go back to very, very old principles. Um, so the very, very old principle is 1975. Um, who are the guys? Uh, uh, Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister, when they wrote the paper on structured design, it then turned into a book. It was all about cohesion and coupling. It was about modularization of software, because otherwise you can't manage it. And then you go into OO and you, you've got the, what shape that those things should be in. But ultimately, it's about getting the size of the box right. And then thinking, yeah, the second step is thinking about getting the boxes right so you can actually uh, have more maintainability. Uh, but, you know, containerization, all for it, fantastic. Um, get the size of the boxes right and, um, and you are literally fulfilling the dreams of people in the mid 70s of how to write software correctly. If you get the sizes of the box wrong, all hell breaks loose. Get them too small and you've got swarms. Get them too big and you've got a mainframe. So it's not about, I don't know why I keep looking at you. It's because that light, that light, it's shining at me. I'll look at you instead, sorry. Um, but it, it's, um, it's why I need my ukulele because it makes me do this. Uh, it, it's creating as many problems as it causes, not because it's the wrong answer, but because people don't know how, know how to build software still properly. So that's fine, as long as we understand that. But when I see things written about, oh, Kubernetes, it's not the thing that it was set up. Yeah, it's, it, it's still just doing the thing. It's still just a bit of tech. Um, and similarly, you know, it's the same with serverless. Serverless started in a fantastic way as, well, you won't have to even think about programming. You'll just have, low code's the same. You won't even have to think about programming because uh, 
all the hard bits taken, taken away. And then you actually start to do things. And all the old stuff, like configuration management, like kind of uh, ver you know, version control, like uh, uh, um, the fact that suddenly you're doing three things that you weren't expecting and it's not architected for that, and uh, et cetera. Uh, so those are what we're seeing as the, as the kind of themes, if you like, in software. So I now feel I've fulfilled the, uh, what I said I'd do in the presentation, and now I can talk about what I like. Um, so the actuals are much more simple and more profound, as I've said here. Talked a bit about costs. Costs are completely out of control. What changed in November, December, January, I'm not quite sure when it changed at the end of last year, beginning of this year, was money started to cost money. So money was free. You could actually uh, have you know, such low interest rates on money that you could borrow for virtually nothing. So you could invest without any overhead. And that changed uh, with a whole bunch of things happening in the markets, with uh, the war, with, uh, with everything else. And suddenly money cost half a percentage point more, then 1% more, and then 1.5% more than it did. And if you're investing a million quid, suddenly that, these start to be very big numbers. Or if you're investing a billion quid, it starts to be very big numbers indeed. Um, we're not yet, when it comes to software, there's an issue with software. It's that no one knows how much it costs at all. And what I hear from CIOs is we've been found out. So when money was free, it was, can I have some more developers? We're building this thing. We're doing digital transformation. It's all great. We're going to change the world. So can I have lots of money? And when I was earlier in my career, I didn't fully realize that some of that was just so I could, the people could get stuff on their CVs. It's, yeah, it's like kind of, we're going to build the most exciting project ever. I'm going to win. I'm going to look so great. It's going to look fantastic on LinkedIn. But no one was really thinking about the costs or how to manage them. And the value stream management stuff starts to kick in at that point. If they were thinking about it properly first, maybe we wouldn't be in this hole. But what changed was CIO then goes back, or the head of development or whatever, then goes back to uh, the people with the money the, on the finance side and says, I need more. And they say, why? He says, I don't know. And then it all falls apart because there's no conversation to be had. He, the IT cannot show where the money is going. It can only show that it's spending far more than it was going to on stuff that isn't provably delivering value. And so we're in a bit of a juncture where until it's a bit like who threw that in the classroom, until you show me how you're spending that money and showing that you are actually delivering value to my organization, I'm not going to give you any more money. And we're hearing that again and again. And so uh, no surprises. I did actually write a blog about this because it kind of both tickled me and made me a bit annoyed. Uh, that when AWS, at a, a couple of years ago, they, they stood up and said, we never said that it was about saving money. Uh, and I, I was like, yes, you absolutely did. <laughs> so I, I then did a lot of research into, and actually they were quite canny. They never did. They got their customers to say it. I know. I know. So, uh, so I, I, I did that, and then I wrote a blog about that. But um, uh, the, that's why we're seeing so much interest in, in cloud cost management, in FinOps. I've got a little footnote in the FinOps book as well, by the way, which I'm very proud of, um, just because I can say it on stage like this, and it makes it, me look like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the um, costs are a massive thing right now. Efficiency is a massive thing. The juncture is real, but we're not quite over the hump yet, so I know what's coming next. What's coming next is computer companies are going to come out with fantastic ways of saving money. It's all about, and we're, actually I'm seeing it. I was on a call with, uh, um, I don't think this was NDA. I was on a call with Cisco. They said, our next goal is simplification of your architecture. I was with a storage company. What we're doing next is simplification. It's all about making things simpler, making things cheaper, making things uh, easier, which brings me on to complexity because um, no one ever thought about uh, you know, letting the genie out of the bottle. No one ever thought that the genies were going to procreate. And we've got lots of little genies running around. They're all turning into big genies, and they're going into little genies. Sorry, that's a bit of an analogy. I'll, I'll, I'll come back on that one. But the long and the short is, and, and the, the slide I've used is uh, the, the magic sorcerer making lots of brooms. Um, 
That's just a reality right now. And you know it's a reality. Uh, even in small organizations, the more that you build, it's a reality in security uh, with the CVEs and uh, the provenance of software. Open source has got challenges there, as you know, um, about which library you're actually using. So then security companies are coming out with tools so that you can find out which library you're using so it can save money, see how this works. Um, but getting on top of complexity is a big thing. We're just not there yet in terms of providing the responses to that. Uh, my top tip is start simple and it's going to get complex less quickly. Complexity, I've probably talked about in the three decades I've worked in tech as the number one theme. It's the one thing we never get past. We never get past complexity. Things always get more complicated than we were thinking they were going to because software is ephemeral. And everything in tech is about software until you get down to a transistor level. And even those are designed by software. I, my first job was as a, as a CAD programmer. So you know, everything is made up. It's all imaginary. Virtualization, it's all imaginary, top to bottom. And therefore, complexity is going to be a thing. And then finally, the big theme, which uh, AWS is still not acknowledging, and why would they? Um, but they will, is, is multi-cloud. On-premise never went away. Someone once likened it to me as the Death Star. That's not AWS. That's your average large company. However much you tinker on the surface, there's a heck of a lot going on underneath, all the way through, right down to the very core, that you will never be able to deal with. And what big companies are, have decided, and probably small companies, and definitely mid-sized companies, is because of the first two things, there's this... So, um, I talked to an organization, they said, we had a scorched earth policy about cloud. Literally, let's get rid of everything, move everything to the cloud. And then, remember what I said about the CFO saying, why? When the CFO said, why? And they said, because it's better. And said, yeah, will it save me money? Yeah. How much? Not very much. So why are you focusing on that as this massive, and it's turning into, you know, spending millions and millions on trying to shift stuff in order to save thousands. And it just doesn't make any sense. So how about, someone said, we just leave it where it is? Because it's not going to, yeah, exactly. Because it, it, it's safe there. It's, it was already sellotape and string. And anyone that's ever seen my programming, actually, my programming was really boring, you know, full of comments, nicely spaced. Didn't do much, but it looked very tidy. But um, uh, so we're seeing uh, the cloud repatriation thing come in. I, I just saw... Uh, um, Four Signals, I think, said they just saved millions on, on moving stuff out of the cloud. But we're seeing it largely in large companies saying, how about we just don't... That job that we were halfway through shift, lifting and shifting workloads into the cloud, how about we just stop that? Because it's not a priority for us anymore to have this full-on, all-in on the cloud strategy. So those are the things that we're seeing, um, which is kind of... Again, as I say, that, that's kind of what I came here to, ta to, to talk to you about. And, um, and how am I doing for time? Has anyone got um, time on? 30. I've got another 10 minutes, I think, haven't I? We'll take another 10 minutes. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. So what I then wanted to talk about was just the, the kind of so what, which is more, it's more slides than just those two, but... The, but it's, it, it's kind of, it, it's more of the wrap up. So the first thing is, let's face it, we're still at the starting blocks. Everything that we've seen, we've been working in this industry, I mean, uh, first computers, yeah, I mean, I'm not quite going back to Ada Lovelace, but the first computers, uh, 50 years, 60 years, etc., cetera, uh, in terms of programming and so on, it's not been long enough, given the, the rate of Moore's law and so on and so forth. Co generally, computer technology has advanced faster than we've been able to mess it up. So we've always been behind the curve, and therefore we've always felt like we were advancing. But Moore's law is already starting to slow down, and I think what we'll start to realize is just what a mess we've made of it. And so uh, we'll, we'll get better on top of it, hopefully over the next 50 years. We, we shall see. Um, it is about automation, as I say. But the, I think the thing, and this is, David, where I said you'll like slide eight because it's about the supply chain. The thing that we haven't fully um, hooked onto 
is that software is a supply chain. So we see this in open source with libraries and so on, largely, but we stop at the tech. What we don't do is we, take, we don't take that supply chain into the organizations that we're serving, into the customers that we're serving. And the reason I'm talking about that is because digital transformation, we seem to have stopped talking about that one. And there's a reason. It's because it hasn't been happening and everyone got a bit bored of pretending that they knew what it meant. And no one ever really knew what it meant. And so we'd better just kind of put that one to bed. But what it actually means is changing your business models using technology. If you're just building stuff, if all it means is, if, if all you do with tech is you buy a new tool, and, and someone actually said to me, um, this was a pretty senior person, a uh, pretty senior technical, it wasn't a CIO, but they said, they thought the digital transformation meant buying a new tool. Literally. You know, get Snowflake, get, you know, get a data warehouse, get, get a data lake, get something, and then you're digital. Get some IoT, and then you're digital. But then everything else has stayed non-digital, analog, in the analog world. The it's not about digital technology driving business. It's about the digital business needing technology, and that's the difference. So if the digital business needs technology, the digital business thrives on a set of requirements that it's trying to fulfill. And that then pulls from its suppliers. And you end up with a pretty reasonable situation. You say, hey, tech people, I need this. And that's the way supply chains work. And that's why I say it's digital supply chain. So how to navigate this personally, um, I think the very simple thing is ask why. So why am I building this? And if you can't, ask, and, and there's always more whys you can ask. Uh, why am I building this? Yes, but what, what is the reason for that reason? And what's the reason for that reason? And if it doesn't land in the business reason, then it's pointless, ultimately. And we should all be doing that all the time. And if our bosses aren't doing that, then we should get new bosses. I know that's quite a straightforward thing to say in a room full of green chairs. But um, it's literally what the business should be doing. And, and one of the issues we've got there, as you know, is the business still thinks that technology just kind of works. So as long as that's true, and the technology people aren't telling them that it doesn't, then we've got a problem. Hold my stomach in while the camera's being uh, out, but there you go. And uh, so um, that's what we can do personally. As a company, there are essentially three business models that we're applying. We're either making ourselves more efficient, we're improving our products, or we're going out to market better. That's it. That's literally it. So if we're not able to say that technology is helping us on one of those three things right from the outset, and then as a software vendor, by the way, if we're not able to say what those three things are for our customers, then we're still doing it wrong. And we see this all the time as analysts where we're building technology in order to satisfy a need that isn't a business need. And if, so it's a kind of easy thing to say, but it's also a very good litmus test. If your technology that you're building does not deliver on digital transformation, then ask yourself, why are you doing it? it, it it's kind of as simple as that. And I'm not saying the ephemeral one. I'm saying, is it changing one of those three business models? Is it helping customers become more efficient? Is it helping them deliver better products? Is it helping them go to market better? That, that's kind of it. And we apply that across strategy, management, and delivery, uh, as I say here. So uh, we see it again and again that organizations don't have a strategy for this. So uh, it's kind of, it's not rocket science. It's like, you know, um, and it's a bit like, you know, uh, Christmas is coming soon, and we've all done this. Uh, it, it's a very human trait to not have a strategy. I will leave my Christmas shopping until far too late, and then I will rush into town in the rain and snow and cold hoping that the things that I'm going to buy will magically appear in the shops and almost be just handed to me. And what do you know, it's much, much, much easier to sit in front of the fire and just with a cup of tea and just write down what Auntie Maud's going to get this year. Oh, she's going to get jam. That's fine. I'll just go to the jam shop. That's all strategy needs to be. It doesn't need to be very complicated. So wrapping up a little bit. Um, <laughs> 
when we're looking at just DevOps, uh, there are... I had a big bit of imposter syndrome when I got back into, into writing just about development because I thought, I used to know it all, but these days, everything's... You know, I'd go to KubeCon and everyone would be rushing around talking with new language that I didn't really think I understood. So I literally spent a year trying to work out how to address my imposter syndrome by talking to a lot of people about what was actually going on. And I found out very handily it divided into 15 things across, uh, across five areas, which makes for a beautiful picture. Um, and... Um, but having, yeah, joking apart, that, that's literally what happened. But joking apart, we're, we're still looking to address the, these areas. We're still looking to get on top of uh, how we automate, you know, everything is code. We're still looking to work with legacy systems. We're still, and, and all of these things have, have to be addressed in some way. So if we're looking to get our own house in order as, as, as the DevOps world, then largely it, it, it's not about carrying on building things. And, and a common theme I hear is, yeah, but people just want to build stuff. And that's fine, but as a, as a business, if you're letting people just build stuff and you're not addressing the everything else, then you're just costing yourself money. So um, uh, we need to get over ourselves a bit. I talked a little bit about value stream management. I said it's about dashboards. I said it's about process improvement and so on. So I don't want to bang on about that too much. These are the areas that uh, we, we decided were important. And I think that at the one point I will pick up on there is end-to-end. -end. So a lot of these things boil down to, to very traditional disciplines for, for me. Uh, uh, one, you know, requirements management, configuration management, risk management, very, very old stuff. If, if, you, if you don't know how to define a requirement, it's worth learning. Test, test. If you don't know how to design a test, it's worth learning because these are all the things that go around uh, expertise. And then you, you build better because you know what the other people are expecting. Just by the way, that's what our picture ended up looking like. Um, with um, there's no top right, by the way. This is this is the th the constant conversation we have about where's your top right? We don't have one. Um, because we, we, we do have a top right, which is the kind of older, more broad players. And then we have a bottom left, which is the, the kind of faster, smarter, more innovative, more feature players, uh, which, which is how our pictures work. Um, but, but there you go. And, and do follow up if, um, if you want any further information on that. But putting this stuff in place to finish then, uh, that old quote by Peter Drucker, Ultimately, it does all boil down to the, 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 the culture of organizations. Cause it, um, and I, I think the point that I just made about um, uh, just letting people do what they like, you, you can get so far with that, but it's costing you money. But if you're assuming that people will just do the right thing, then, then that's costing you money too. So, so, so that's really... Um, the only point I'm trying, I'm suddenly realizing I'm, I'm saying the same thing in three different ways. So I'm going to move on very quickly and say it's all about mountains. And um, the one thing I would leave on really uh, is so what have we seen? We've seen there's all these new things that we can do with tech. We've seen, you know, there's the AI, AI stuff. We've seen that there's, there's the, the process improvement stuff, et cetera. And, uh, and actually, we're walking in the mud. We're walking in deep mud right now and we're trying to get on top of it. So the biggest thing we can do at this point is start thinking strategically. And what I've, I've just written a blog about this because what I've realized is that even in everything that we're doing, we're still thinking tactically. We're still thinking, oh, well, I just need, and it'll be, I don't know, a Kubernetes software security management system, and then everything will be okay and all my problems will go away and I can get on with just building stuff again. It, it's, no, it's no longer true. And back to the conversation, it was never true. Back to the th conversation I had with that vendor where they thought that they'd worked out the perfect process stuff. They don't know how to get to the top of the mountain. Do, is, do you know uh, Killian Journey? Have you heard of him? He's, um, uh, he's the fastest person up Mont Blanc. I think he's actually now the fastest person up Everest. He went up and down. He ran. Uh, I mean, don't worry about oxygen deprivation if you just leg it, you know, it's, uh, it's fantastic. But what, what we see again and again with anyone trying to solve for this is they get halfway up the mountain and they run out of steam. And I think for software companies, it's often, they're just hoping they get bought before they run out of steam. 
uh, but the bigger companies um, have ideas in order to keep their customers going for another few years. So no one's ever really tried to get to the top of the mountain, which is really sad. So the point here was we're all on different routes, but beware full summits because you may think that you're aiming for the top, but actually uh, the real summit is, is eluding you. And the reason it's eluding you is back to the, the software supply chain thing. It's because we're not addressing the business needs from the start. So that's kind of, that's my wrap up, if you like. And if we've got any time for questions, I'd happily take them. Sir? Yep. Okay, let's jump back to that. Okay, so, um, right, so what I talked about earlier was the next one? Yeah, okay. So I, I jumped around a bit and kind of held it all in my head. Um, so what I talked about much earlier was the way we build research, which is uh, we do it as an RFP process and we have the mandatory requirements, which is essentially does your software deploy, provide dashboards onto your software development process? In, in this instance. And then we've got the key features, which are, can it actually come back to what I, what I was uh, talking about just now, which is, does it do the business level stuff? Can you do root course analysis? Does it actually give AI driven sometimes? Linear B is a great little product for that, um, for, for improvement insights. And can you manage stuff as a portfolio, um, which links into uh, project portfolio management practice? So all the agile PPM tooling and so on are largely giving strategists the tools that they need to say, here's our five key initiatives for the organization for the next two years. How do we measure them, et cetera? So what Value Stream Management Done Well does is it plugs the development into the top-down uh, strategy and portfolio-driven stuff. Yes, kind of. Uh, so if you look at CICD, generally it's following a, a reasonable set of steps that, you know, you, you're going to be designing something, you're going to be coding it, you're going to be testing it, etc. Et that, that, that's re reasonably well mapped, but it, no one's ever wanted to put too much restriction on those things. When it was back in waterfall days, it was very much requirements, specification, design, um, uh, development, Unit testing, user acceptance, it was like it was very strict, struct, strict, structured and rigid. Easy for me to say. Um, whereas when Agile came along, it was all just about, what can you do this week? Let's have a scrum. Let's have a, you know, let's have some, uh, so, some function points. Let's have some user stories. Let's have some epics. It, and it's very much kind of, um, and I was a pre-Agile consultant. I was a DSDM consultant. So it was all about time boxing, just kind of, uh, just, just get some stuff done. But the, the GSD has lost touch with uh, actually those bigger, slower ways of doing things. So all the tools that you've got, your CICD tools, they enable you to go through the process. But what they don't do is they, they don't try to give you any structure, particularly. So what Value Stream Management does is it acts as an overlay so you can see your process and then see where the problems are within the process. But again, it's not trying to restrict the process. Sir? So, uh, we are in this together, IT and business. Yep. When we stop on this, no more free cash. And who should bring first? The business has to say, okay, guys, you have to deliver value now. Or should IT say, you know what? We probably need to know what business needs to stop raising everyone's money. I think, actually, <laughs> The order I saw it was IT blinked first, uh, but they blinked too late for the cloud, and then the business blinked, and IT's kind of embarrassedly saying, we're trying to sort it out, but it's, they, should, they should never have got themselves into that place in the first place. So uh, I, I think the, um, the, and the IT blinked first are definitely about cloud. It was, um, and the, the way I see it is very simple. We're moving from uh, the cloud to a cloud. It just becomes part of, it, 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 it's just a, a change of terminology. It's super duper important. And some organizations will be able to do everything 
on a cloud, uh, but mo bigger businesses won't. Um, so, so that was IT's blink, but the, the cost moment was the CFO, definitely. Um, and that was happening last year, but then it just became, it became kind of set in stone, if you like, o over Christmas last year. Uh, but we're still, there were a lot of layoffs, as you know, in tech companies. That was, that was a kind of tactical move. Um, and I think that was largely, if, if I'm not mistaken, that was largely the big players had hired people so that their uh, competitors couldn't get them and they weren't doing anything with them. And they suddenly realized how dumb that was. Uh, so, so they then just kind of stopped doing that stupid thing. And it looked like they were making a lot of layoffs, but actually they were just not holding on to people for no reason. No, nit nitpick away. Um, so, um, the. Hang on, I'll just. Uh, so, the whole. If you take the expression journey to the cloud, it, there's a lot to unpack there in that very short expression. It says, A, you're on a journey. And it says, to, wards, obviously. I'm just getting rid of that word. But then to the cloud. So it says, there is a place that you are going where everything will just work. And that's not actually what's happening. There isn't a place where you can go and everything just works. And um, you know, all of the cloud providers have got different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Azure is, is, is kind of, um, uh, it's done typical Microsoft second mover advantage, but it, it doesn't care where your stuff runs. It could be on-prem, it could be in the cloud, as long as you stay in Microsoft shop, so, so they're happy. Uh, AWS, it's just a bunch of bricks. Um, and uh, you manage them all individually. Uh, so it, it then creates, you know, um, and they're, they're working on that, I know, which is great. Um, but the, the A cloud thing is, the multi, so multi-cloud, every large organization is using at least two hyperscalers now. So you can't say we're going to one place because they're completely different places. It's not like they're all the same place, it's just different flavors. They're, they're, just, they're, they're just completely different places. And the second thing is they're not the only places. So you can choose multiple ver uh, cloud providers within an overall architecture. I don't like the term cloud at all because it messes with your head. I like the term multi-platform architecture, but no one's going to adopt that. But, because, but ultimately, there's multiple places you can run stuff and you're making a, a, a decision based on the, the advantages of, of doing it in one place. I'm, you know, I'm, a great fan of, um, I'm a great fan of Kubernetes for that reason because in principle, you can run anywhere uh, within you know, obvious um, technical um, reason, issue reasons. Uh, and similarly, I was always a great fan of, of virtual machines because, again, in principle, you can lift them and shift them with, with relatively less, uh, less effort. But keeping in mind that the whole hyperscaler model was to get you in and not let you out, you know, hence egress fees, hence you know, talking about wall gardens, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera, um, which was great, great business model. I, I can't, can't fault it. Um, so yeah, it, it's a state of mind, ultimately. So, so it's, a good, it's a good nitpick, but it's getting away from that kind of, ah, oh, wonderful place that we can arrive at and it's, everything's just going to work. Any more, David? What did I miss? Oh, this guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that, that, that's pretty much it. And, and then we've got to think, well, how are we going to build to that? And so the, 
as, as I said earlier, that everything's ephemeral in tech. So we've got two choices. Either we let that ephemerality get out of control and we end up with too much complexity that we don't know what to deal with, uh, or we use that ephemerality to our advantage. Uh, so I'm very interested in WebAssembly, for example, and what we can do with that, um, uh, because it's just different places to put the lines. David. Yeah, so you have earlier a, a, ben, well, a three circle diagram from yeah. the Venn diagram about uh, cost and cloud and complexity. Uh, but, it's, uh, but it seems to me that um, in some sense there's a tension. Um, I agree with you that in the end you want lower costs and people want to reduce complexity and use multi cloud to hopefully reduce their costs. Yep. But it seems to me that there's a tension between complexity and multi-cloud. No one's ever accused Kubernetes of being the simplest possible system. Yep. And when you say, I'm going to use multiple clouds, um, even if you use one as the primary and one as the spare, which is, I think, the simplest way to use multi-clouds, yep. you are still adding complexity. Absolutely. 100%. So it seems to me that there's a tension between multi-cloud and complexity. How do you square that? Um, very quickly, because I know we need, to, we need to wrap up. So, so the answer is all of these things are problems, and they're all driving each other. So the tensions you identify are um, the mud that we're running through, if you like. Multi-cloud engenders complexity and cost. Um, the, the change that we've got to make is accepting that. That's the only thing. It, it, it's literally, if we're going to, if we're, oh, literally, no one is building for multi-cloud. We're all still building as though there's only one target. No one's building as though um, we're not sure where things are going to be next week. And certainly, sorry, no vendor is providing the tooling. So something like Harness uh, discovered a magical thing when they, with, with their deployment tooling. Uh, that built in cost management, and they said, people are using us to see how expensive something is on AWS, check the cut pricing on Azure, and then shift it over if they can save $100,000. That was by accident. We need that stuff to be on purpose. Uh, not, not, sorry, when I say no one's building, build a, yeah, developers are creating great things, but we don't have the environments within which this stuff is taken into account. It's coming. It's coming. At the moment, a lot of FinOps stuff is just a spreadsheet and a consultant. It's coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, being here.